All right, good evening again. Again, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Grace Life Bible Church and to the conference. The theme this year is um, Pauline Neurotheology, uh, Building Godly Character One Thought at a Time. Uh, we, had, we had a good start to the, the weekend with uh, uh, Craig's lesson in that last session, and I want to get started. Um, the topic that I'm going to cover with you in this hour is simply titled Pauline Neurotheology, What Is It? Okay. So Craig kind of touched on a few things that I'm going to cover, but he did not cover them in the, in the same sort of depth that, that I want to talk to you about them uh, this evening. Uh, first of all, turn with me in your Bible, and I should say this. What I'm going to cover right now is kind of like what we ended with last year, okay? So we're starting this year. I'm going to say a lot of similar things to what I said last year at my last study last year um, to, to get this study rolling. But turn with me in your Bible to every place where it mentions the word brain. She's going to get right on that, okay, right? So are you. There, it's not there, right? So does that mean you don't have a brain? Because the Bible doesn't say the word brain. Does that mean you don't have a brain? No, okay? That's, that, uh, that's obviously not the case, right? It's taken for granted by most everyone, okay, uh, except scientists, of course, that there's a difference between the mind, immaterial, and the brain, material. If I show you a picture of the, uh, if I flash up a flashcard of the uh, University of Michigan logo, are you going to have a reaction to it? Yes, yeah, some of you are going to be like, oh, geez. All, the, all those of you like Mark back there, he's going to be all excited, right? But the point is, when I flash that up, can we scan your brain and see something going on in your brain? In your brain chemistry, when we flash up images or do different things, right? So we understand that the brain is a part of the human physiology. When I was in college, I took, a, I took an anatomy and physiology class, and they call the brain the command center of the body, right? Your brain is doing all sorts of things all the time, and you're not even thinking about them. It's controlling your involuntary reflexes, right? Your breathing, your heart rate, all these things. You're not sitting there. You ever just sat there and think about your heart beating, and it, like, creeps you out, okay? You, all this stuff is just happening, and it's all being done through your what? Through your brain, okay? The distinction between the physical body slash brain and the immaterial mind is what is known as, in philosophy as dualism. Okay? So in other words, I have a body, right? You can see it, right? You know who I am. You identify Brian Ross through the way my voice sounds, the way I look, how you, what you know of me as far as my mannerisms and so forth. But, that, but my body, is that the real me? The real me is, the, is the, the spiritual being that is me, right? That inhabits this body, right? That, that, I, that animates this, this flesh, okay? So... Philosophers talk about these things, and, and this is known as this is what's called dualism. That there's a distinction between the 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 uh, the body and the immaterial, the mind. Okay. In contrast, just to be clear about it, materialists believe that humans are just what matter. That's it, right? That the only thing that exists is what matter, and that your who you are is just the soup of chemicals that you have in your brain and that you're nothing beyond that and all that exists is what? Matter. That's what materialism maintains, right? Now, come with me if you would to start this. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to kind of figure out, I was tr trying to figure out a way to get this started here. And I was like just figuring it out, by the way, like five minutes ago. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look with me at verse... 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Okay, now that's not H-O-L-Y, holy. That's holy, like what? Fully, totally, completely holy, right? The, it, the, your whole person, your whole being, right? And I pray, God, your whole spirit, that verse talks about your what? Your spirit, then what? Soul, so you have a soul, and then it says your what? Your body, be preserved blameless, it says, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So God's Word says that you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a what? Body, right? Your body is material or immaterial? 
Your body's material, right? Your soul and spirit, are these material or immaterial? These are immaterial. I'm not going to go through all the verses right here, but this is these two things are what the Bible calls your outward man or your inward man. This is your inward man, right? What's this? This is your outward man, right? But you are a whole person possessing a spirit, a soul, and a what? Now let me ask you a question. Does a lost man have all three of these? Yep. Lost, does a lost man have a spirit? Yeah, the lost man has a spirit. It's dead to the life of God. Do they have a soul? Yeah, they have a soul. Do they have a body? They have all three of these, right? So let me ask you a question. When a lost man is walking around, does he think to himself, I'm two people? He doesn't think of himself as two people. He thinks of himself as one whole what? Person. He might not, if he's never read the Scriptures... He might not know about the difference between his immaterial self and his what? Material self, but he's got one whether he realizes it or not, right? Okay, come with me to Colossians chapter 2. Come over to Colossians chapter 2. Now, what about a saved person? For a lost man, are his soul and spirit bound hard to his body? Are they joined to his body? Okay, something happened though when you got saved. Look at Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 11. Something happened when you got saved that fundamentally changed you, okay? God performed an operation on you, verse 11, Colossians 2, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without what? So this is a spiritual thing, right? Now watch, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? So because, when you trusted the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, did he perform an operation on you that separated your soul and spirit away from your body? Okay, You are no longer, as a saved person, you are no longer bound to that sinful flesh the way you were before, right? And this is where people get all confused. They, if you're a saved person, do you still have a soul? You still have a spirit. You still have a body. The difference is now who dwells in your spirit? The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in your spirit, right? But how many of us still walk around thinking now, now that we're saved, that we're now two different people? That we're a schizophrenic saint? That we have an old nature and then we have a new nature? How many of us think that? A lot of people think that, right? And there's whole books that have been written about that, right? What I want to get you to see, and what Craig was after in the last hour, was the fact that you, as a believer, are you one whole complete person with a totally new identity? Okay? The lost man, as Craig read the verses, does he have a heart? I'm not going to spend all night trying to tell you whether your heart aligns with your soul or whether your heart aligns with your spirit. I know the heart is a function of my what? Inner man. Now, I have a physical heart, but I also have a spiritual what? A spiritual heart, right? So I'm just going to put the heart here and say the heart is in your inner man, Okay? Now, the lost man, Craig read the verses in Romans. What's the state of the lost man's heart? It's dark. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can what? Who can know it, right? Uh, Genesis chapter 6, God looks at mankind and he says that the thoughts and imaginations of his heart were only evil. How often? Continually, right? Now, what's the difference between that lost man and the saint? The difference between the lost man and the saint is who's now in Go to Romans chapter 5. Go to Romans chapter 5. God the Holy Spirit, God's Word identifies exactly where the Holy Spirit dwells. Okay? Romans chapter 5, the, God's Word identifies exactly where the Holy Spirit dwells. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse, well, start at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. Now look at verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Okay, why? Because the love of God is shed abroad where? Where? In our hearts by who? The Holy Ghost, which is what? When God gave you the Holy Spirit upon redemption, where did He put the Holy Spirit? He put, him, he put the Holy Spirit where? 
in your heart, right? So what used to be deceitful and wicked, what used to be only evil continually, what used to be wretched and, and, and enmity with God and so on and so forth, by virtue of the fact that you've trusted Christ, you've experienced a circumcision made without hands, God Almighty has put His Holy Spirit where? Right in your heart. Go to Galatians 4. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Folks, if this is true, then this means that is God good with you at the very core of who you are? Okay, Romans, or where I tell you to go? Galatians 4. Go to Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Watch what it says. It says, and because ye are sons. We should go up, sorry, verse, 10, verse 5. To, uh, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, where? Into your hearts, crying what? So, as a saint of the Most High God, who's in your heart now? The Lord Jesus Christ, through the presence of the indwelling what? Holy Spirit, right? So, are you all good here? What about here? Eh. Yeah. Calvin's right. Not so much, right? Where does the sin nature reside? Here, okay? So if your heart's good, what's, what is one part of your body? Your brain. Go, go to, go to uh, Romans 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. What I'm going to suggest to you, and what we've sort of been talking about, this or we'll be talking about throughout this weekend, is we need to come to the realization of about the fact that is God good with our inner man? The thing that's in process daily is what? This. Okay? This is the thing that's in process daily. So I want to talk to you about that a little bit in detail. Romans chapter 12 and I want to go through, I'm going to skip verse, we'll just read verse 1, and I want to cover some things with you here in verse 2. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? So we, it's, it's commonly understood that when you get to Romans chapter 12, are you now in the practical section of the book of Romans? Okay? Paul's talked to you about your justification. He's taught, in, in Romans 1 through 5, he's talked to you about your justification. In Romans 6, 7, and 8, he talks to you about your identity in Christ, right? In Romans 9, 10, and 11, he, he talks about dispensational things, and he explains what the status of Israel is today during the dispensation of grace. But when you get to Romans chapter 12, he calls your attention there in verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. In other words, on the basis of everything I've already said in the first 11 chapters, here, is, here should be the reaction to that in your life right? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? What are you presenting as a living sacrifice? Your body, not your what? This is already what? This is already taken care of, right? This is already dealt with. This is already, I dare I say, fixed, but I'd rather say made new, a new creature, right? You're not that old man running around. He's made you a new what? Creature. He made you a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so what he's going to now talk about is what you're going to do where? In your body. How are you going to use your body as a believer? Okay, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so I want to break that down with you a little bit here this evening. Okay, notice what that first phrase of verse 2 says. It says, and be not conformed to this world. Okay, notice that that's a negative phrase. It's a negative phrase. It's telling you what not to what? Be. It's not saying, go do this. It's saying, don't what? Don't do this. Don't do that. Okay, Not in the sense of the law, but it's a negative phrase. It is instructing believers what not to be. So look at it again. And be not conformed to this what? So as a believer, am I supposed to be conformed to the world? No, that's what I'm not supposed to what? That's what I'm not supposed to be. Okay. 
Paul does not want the believers to be formed to be conformed to this world. Now, if you look at that verse, it says, and be not conformed to this world. The verb that's translated conformed there appears one other time in the Greek New Testament supporting the King James Bible, and it carries the following meaning. It means to confirm one's self, i.e. one's mind or character, to another's pattern. I'll read that again. It means to conform oneself, i.e. their mind and character, to another's pattern. Hold your hand there and come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Hold your hand there and come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. So we're looking at what we're not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be conformed to this what? World, okay? Go over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look with me at verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 14. So there's some things going on here in the context that we don't have time to get into fully. I want, to look, I want you to look at the use of a word here. Verse 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's some things going on here for Israel, but look at verse 14. As obedient, what? Children, now watch this, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. You see that phrase there in verse 14 where it says, not fashioning yourselves? That's the same, that's the same word and phrase that's translated in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not what? Conformed. Okay, so what does it mean to not be conformed? The Bible's defining that for you. What it means is to not fashion your what? Yourself. Right? To not fashion yourself after the course of the world, or after the world, okay? So there's a meaning there, and it's interesting, if you look up the, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, offers the following definition of the root word conform, okay? It means to form, shape, or fashion according to some pattern, mold, or instruction to make of the same form or character, and then that, the dictionary actually gives you Romans 12, 2 as an example of that word being used that way, okay? So go back to Romans 12, 2. When he says, and be not conformed to this world, he's talking about not fashioning yourself after the course of what? The world, okay? So do we have a choice here? We have a choice here, right? You have a choice whether you're going to be conformed to the world or whether we're going to see in a minute whether you're going to be transformed. Okay? More about that here. Go, look, look at verse 2. So Paul does not want believers, in, in that, look at verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Paul does not want believers to be fashioning themselves according to the world. Believers are to be of a different character than the world. Okay? Now, I want to get technical with you just for a minute. I know you all love me when I get technical. Okay, look at the verse. And be not conformed. The verb there, conformed, if you look at it in Greek, and I know, I'm going to talk about Greek for a second, it's middle or passive. Okay? Now you say, the voice is middle, it's, it's, it's middle or passive, and you say, that's great. <laughs> that helps me a lot. It actually does help you a lot, because what this means is that in terms of being conformed to the world, you can either be actively engaged in the process of conforming to the world, or if you just stand back and do nothing, are you going to be conformed to the world? It's not a neutral thing, folks. If you just sit back here and twiddle your thumbs and, you know, oh, well, whatever's going on is going on, is the world conforming you to itself automatically as a default? Yes. That's what this is saying. He's saying, and be not conformed to this world, okay? You, so this means in terms of being conformed to the world, one can either be actively engaged in the process, like Demas, right? Demas forsook Paul, having loved the things of what? The world, right? So was he actively running after the things of the world, Demas? Yeah. But even if you're not like Demas, and even if you're not running after the things of the world, and you're just sitting here like you got the car in neutral, and you're not really doing anything, is the world still conforming you to its system? Yes. That is a natural process. 
in the present, Paul does not want believers to be conformed to the world, okay? So it's so the bottom line is this, okay? Conformity to the world is happening regardless of whether you are actively participating or not. It's happening. Think about how you are bombarded all the time by news media, by sports, by all the things that are out there, right, to, 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 to try to grab your time and attention. A lot of the things that we deal with, maybe they're not inherently evil things, but they're things that the world is offering to you to take up your life, and before you know it, if you follow them, you're off doing whatever it is that you're doing, not even remembering or realizing how you got there, right? That's the way the world works. Hold your hand there and go to Ephesians 2. The reality is this, folks. Every one of us came into the world with the same default setting. Okay? Before you were saved, what was the set, what was the status? Before you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, what was the status of your heart, the status of your inner man? It's dark. It's dead to the life of God. Okay? Where I tell you to go? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. The lost man, is he dead in trespasses and sins? Okay? Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also, so he's talking to believers here, and he says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as what? So each one of us, each and every one of us, came into the world with the default setting to walk according to the course of what? Why is it so easy, even for a believer, to go back right into the sin? Because your brain has been programmed by the course of the world to cope with your life in certain ways. You have habits, you have addictions, you have coping mechanisms, you have things that have been hardwired in there by the course of what? The world, right? And now that you're saved, now that you've got the Holy Spirit living in your heart, has your brain just been wiped clean of all that stuff? No, it's still where? Still there. It's still there. Now, your thing might be different from my thing, different from the next guy's thing, but is all that stuff still there? Okay? Now, let me, let me just make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. So according to these verses, we are good at this. We're good at it. Not because we're schizophrenic now. We're good at it because we've, been tra we've trained this thing here to deal with life in certain what? Certain way. Okay? Go to Colossians chapter 2. No, we, you don't need to go there. So even though there's nothing wrong, let's go there again. I'm sorry. Go to Colossians chapter 2. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 11 again. It says, in whom, also all, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? So folks, even though there's nothing wrong with our inner man until the day of redemption, do we still reside in a body of flesh that is subject to sin and the course of the world? We do. Okay, go back to, go back to Romans 12. Go back to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> now look at verse 2 again. And be not conformed to this world. What's the next word? But. So is there a contrast? Okay, now let's establish and remember what we learned so far. Is conformity to the course of the world active or passive? It's both. Right? Right? You can actively run after the world and sin and the lust of the flesh and all that. You can do it actively and be fully engaged in the process of doing that. 
or you can just be sitting in your chair, your lazy boy at home doing nothing, and is the world conforming you to its system? Yes, thank you. Appreciate that, Ernie. Okay. But, so how do you combat that? How do you combat automatic conformity to the world? How do you combat it? You combat it by doing something about it, right? And it says in the verse, but be ye what? Transformed. See, the difference here, the, 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 the Christian life is really an issue of are you going to be conformed or are you going to be what? Transformed. Now, you, you're going to be conformed one way or another unless you actively seek to do what? Transform. Verse 2, and be, uh, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How are we to avoid conformity with the world? The way we avoid conformity with the world is being transformed, Okay. The Greek word translated there, transform, is literally the word metamorpho. What does that mean? To metamorpho literally means to change into another form. A caterpillar, Craig mentioned this earlier, a caterpillar goes through a what? Metamorphosis. Whereby they emerge in a totally different what? Form. That's what that's talking about. So let me ask you a question. What needs to be, what needs to be transformed here? This or this? Is this good? This is good until the day of redemption. Until the day of redemption, this isn't so good. Right? So when he says here in the verse, he says, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We'll get to that part of it in a minute here. Just, just work with me. The word there is the transformed, the, trans, uh, the transform there is the metamorpho, the metamorphosis, the change into another form, okay? And again, this is where we get our English word metamorphosis from, which means that word metamorphosis to t uh, the action or process of changing in form, shape, or substance. Okay? A complete change in appearance, circumstances, condition, or character of a person. We see this, as I mentioned, in the process whereby a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. Conformity to the world is combated by transformation. One is either going to be conformed or transformed. There's no middle ground here. Okay? So if I don't do anything, am I going to be conformed to the world? Yep. So how do I deal with that? The way I deal with that is by actively seeking to be what? Transformed. Okay? If I'm going to seek to be transformed to combat conformity, then I'm going to have to make some decisions, personal, intentional, faith decisions, based upon God's Word, to do things differently than the course of what? The world. Okay? So how is transformation accomplished then? Well, look at what the verse says. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. How? How are you going to be transformed? By the renewing of your what? Your mind. So the way this metamorphosis, the way this transformation is going to be accomplished is by the renewing of the mind. This means that transformation slash metamorphosis is brought about by the process of renewing the mind. Okay? So... You can read that verse like this, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the, your mind, and you can think that those two things are the same. Can I suggest to you that, the that they're not the same, and the transformation is brought about by the process of renewing your what? So in other words, let's, let's think back. Let's think backwards. Renewing your mind causes what? Transformation. Transformation is the way you combat what? Conformity. Conformity is automatic, passive or active. The way you deal with that is you engage in transformation, and the way you engage in transformation is by renewing your what? Your mind. Is it, you guys following that? Only one person is, so that's, that's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so all of this leads then to an interesting... So let me, I got ahead of myself, and I apologize, okay? So the one brings about the other. That's what I was trying to say there just a moment ago. 
So the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind, is that a material or an immaterial process? Yes. When you renew your mind in God's Word, I believe that God's Word, working in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, works to transform your what? Your brain. To rewire your brain in accordance, not with the course of the world, but in accordance with what? God's Word. Okay? And as you do that, and as you, as Des is going to talk about tomorrow morning, as you know who you are, you reckon what God says about you to be so, and you yield to that actively in your life, by taking action, uh, uh, faith action in God's Word, when you do that, does it, re does it start to build new circuits in your brain? Okay, that's what, that's what I'm saying. All this leads to the interesting question then, which I kind of already said, what exactly is being transformed by the renewing of, their, of your mind? Okay, well, as we saw um, uh, earlier in the introduction, there's nothing wrong with your inner man. Even our former heart issues have been dealt with through our justification. God the Holy Spirit resides where? In your heart. God the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart by faith. So then what's left to be transformed? I believe that it's your brain. I believe that when we renew our minds, it transforms and rewires our brains. And I believe that our brains stand in the way of having the life of Christ. Is the life of Christ in you as a believer? Is it there? Right? So what's stopping it from being manifested? What's stopping it from, being, from showing up in your mortal flesh? Go, go with me to 2 Corinthians 4. What is standing in the way between the life of Christ that's in you, between God the Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart by faith, through the indwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit, what's stopping the life of Christ that's here from showing up in your body? from showing up and being made manifest in your mortal flesh. This is why, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 10. It says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now watch, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? Does God want to manifest His life? Does God want the life of Christ manifested in the body of a believer? Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Body a what? Living sacrifice. Right? So what is standing in the way? Look at the next verse. Verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? What's stopping? So is his life indisputably in you? Yes. What's stopping this life that's here from showing up and being manifest here? It's that stinking thinking. That's what it is. It's that rotten thought process that's still ingrained where? In your brain. So my hypothesis, our hypothesis, the hypothesis that Craig and I have discussed is that spiritual realities are necessarily experienced by and dependent on the brain until the day of redemption. Think about this for a minute. Is your brain involved when you read the Bible? Can you read the Bible without using your brain? Some people maybe, they, they check their brain at the door, I don't know. But th my point is, if I'm going to read it, do, whether I understand it properly or not, do I have to use my brain to do it? Yes. If I'm going to pray, do I have to use my brain to pray? So even the things that we do as believers, that express, you know, uh, expressions of, of, our, of life and, and, and spiritual vitality, such as reading the Word of God and praying and serving and other things, do they necessarily involve the use of your brain? Yes, they do, right? I, was, I, I talked about this last, last year. Uh, one of the books that Craig and I read is a very fascinating book. They, take, they, took, they took Catholic nuns reciting rosaries with their beads 
and they, and they scanned their brains while the Catholic nuns were reciting rosaries with their beads to see what part of their brain was lit up when they were doing that. <laughs> then they took Buddhist monks who were doing their meditation and their chants, and they scanned their brains to see what part of their brains were lit up when they were doing that. Guess what? The exact same center of the brain was engaged for the nuns doing their rosaries as the Buddhist monks doing their chants. What that tells me is that your flesh likes religion. It likes to have something to do. Your brain, there's, there's, there's things that are actively going on in your brain when you do that stuff that are rewards and, and, and chemicals and so forth that are, oh, we're just doing something so good here, right? Which is why your flesh likes the law. Because the law gives your flesh something to what? Something to do, right? So then you come along and you hear the grace message, and you hear that you're saved by grace through faith without the law, and you're like, woohoo, good. Now what? Now I'm, certainly I'm going to manifest the life of Christ in me by keeping the law. Eh, wrong. You don't keep the law to get saved. You don't keep the law to stay saved. You don't keep the law to prove you're what? Saved. Okay? So the problem, our brains have been formed, literally wired, by every sensory experience and your reaction to them since the time you were born. So here's the problem, okay? Number one, let's go back to Ephesians 2. Craig was right. When he first brought this stuff up to me, I wondered where his brain was. Okay, he's right, but one thing I appreciate about Craig a lot is the fact that he's always been willing to challenge me when I thought I was wrong about stuff. And um, that's actually led to a lot of good studies and other things, especially in the, in the uh, realm of the King James Bible and different things along those lines. But the problem is that the natural man, number one, the natural man automatically follows the course of the world. Again, that's Ephesians 2, that's, that's verses 2 and 3 here, right? That at the end of verse 2, you were uh, now working on the children of disobedience, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as what? So our first problem is that the natural man has, pro has programmed the brain, the course of the world has programmed the brain to think and function and weigh things and cope with things and deal with things and has established, established things in the brain from the time you were born. Okay? The second thing is, go, back, go to Romans 7. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, but go to Romans 7. The second problem is, is that our physical body is sold under sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Romans chapter 7, verse 14, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold under what? So Paul's body, your body, my body, is it a slave? It, 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 all it knows how to do is what? Sin. And is your brain part of your body? Number three, I already just said it. Number three, the brain is part of our physical body. This is on the basis, I would say, of observational fact. Right? I mean, if you lay me on the ground right now and cut my head open, you will eventually find my brain. Eventually. Okay? Number four, therefore our brains, the main conduit through which we interact and relate, is carnal, sold under what? Sin. Okay? Romans, Romans 7, verses 14 through 23, we'll talk about them tomorrow. So, the, so let's just take all this together. So the brain has been wired by the lie program. The lie program of the, of the adversary has wired your brain through every sensory experience that you've ever had to follow the course of what? The world. Okay? Go to Colossians chapter 1. Go to Colossians chapter 1.
Look with me, Ch Colossians chapter 1. If we look at verse 21. Notice what it says. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies where? In your mind, how? By wicked works. Yet now hath he what? You understand that we were enemies in our mind by wicked works. Do you understand that every time that you acted on the basis of your flesh, and you took action, whether it's a pornography addiction, whether it's a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, whether it's a, um, you know, um, a, curse, a cursing problem, or hatred, or envy, or malice, or evil speaking, whatever it is, every time you did that, you, you strengthened a circuit where? In your brain. Okay. We were enemies in our mind by wicked works, acting in accordance with acting in accordance with wicked works, solidified brain circuits then, which formed habits and addictions. And even though believers have been made perfect in Christ, we do not possess two natures struggling against each other. Our brains are still sending us deceptive brain messages that are contrary to the truth of who God has made us in Christ right? Your brain is saying, you're a loser. You're a failure. You did this. You did that. You were mean to your wife. You were mean to your kids. You looked at that. You went there. You are not anything at all like what God's Word says about you. That's what your flesh is doing all the time. That's what your brain is doing all the time. It's like Craig said, we have to come to a place where we realize that what he says here about our inner man, about our heart, about the Holy Spirit, is true of each and every one of us. It's not just true about the guy next to you or the woman next to you. It's true for every person who has trusted the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So Romans, the battle for the brain. I'm previewing now what we're going to do tomorrow morning. What if we viewed Romans 6, 7, and 8 as the battle for the brain? Okay, go to Romans 6 with me. You know what, I'm not going to do that. Because if I do that, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not, never going to finish. So I'll just sort of say what, what we're going to be talking about tomorrow morning. Romans 6 is establishing who you are in Christ. And it's about building habits of righteousness. Over and over again, Romans 6 is based on the idea of know ye not, reckon it to be so, and yield your what? Your members as servants of righteousness. When you know, reckon, and then you yield on the basis of truth by faith, you know what you do? You start to transform your what? Okay? I used this illustration last year. I'm going to use it again. At our house, I'm not an artiste, okay? So this is our house, and this is our barn, okay? Does the horse need to be fed every day? Every day, twice a day, right? Give or take. Okay. <laughs> Do we all have pathways that we walk all the time? to get to the barn, right? In your flesh, do you have well-trodden pathways to the barn that you walk all the time and you don't even need to think about walking it? It just what? It just happens. You ever been driving somewhere that you drive to all the time and you're like, how in the world did I get here? And you literally can't remember driving to that spot because your brain, your subconscious brain is just what? It's just doing it, right? I've probably, my parents live in Wisconsin. I've probably, in the last 20 years, driven to Wisconsin probably 200 times. I remember one time I was driving through Chicago, and I'm on 294 right around uh, Great America, and I'm like, we're at Great America already. How did we get here? But we had gotten there, right? But was my brain on autopilot? 
right? Now follow my illustration, right? Do you all have things? We all have to go to the barn, right? And you have flesh coping mechanisms, coping mechanisms that you use, that you've used your whole life to go where? To the barn, right? What we're talking about is when you renew your mind and you're transformed and not conformed, you start to establish a new what? A new pathway to where? The barn. And when you know, when you know about what's going on, you reckon it to be so, and you yield it, and you walk it tomorrow, and then you walk it Sunday, and then you walk it Monday, what do you start to do with this pathway? You start to establish a new what? A new pathway to the barn. Now, are you ever going to totally get rid of that one? No, you might, especially if it's especially if it's a dependency or something along those lines. But you're never going to totally get rid of that. But as you renew your mind, are you able to make the faith choice to walk to the barn a different way and establish a new what? That's what that thing is about up there. About this weak pathway and the strong pathway. About neuroplasticity. About renewing about your brain literally being able to establish new ways, uh, new habits. You look at, can an can a, can a unsaved man, through some sort of meditation, change certain things about his life? Yeah. You go to AA, do these different things, right? And can you change certain things about your life? But you know what you can't do? You can't manifest the life of Christ in your mortal flesh. You can improve your flesh, you can improve certain things about yourself, but unless you're knowing, unless you're reckoning and obeying God's word, the life of Christ is never going to show up in your mortal flesh. You understand what I'm saying? So let's go. I'm almost out of time. Come with me back to Romans 12. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here. Let me just say two things about Romans 7. In Romans 7, tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about the enslavement of the flesh, the brain, and the fact that what the brain needs, the renewed mind, is to be the new master of the carnal brain. The renewed mind is to be the new master of the carnal brain and transform that carnal brain into a servant of righteousness. We'll talk about that tomorrow, and then we'll also talk about Romans 8, the hope of the Spirit. And then in the evening, Craig's going to talk about the issue of deceptive brain messages and practical applications of all of this and um, how to recognize and identify deceptive brain messages and then what to do about them when they show up, because they will show up. Go, to, go, to, go back to Romans and we'll... Romans 12. I hope what I'm saying is making sense to you. Romans 12.2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, let me just recap. Are you being conformed? Yes. You are being conformed either actively or what? Passively. It's happening one way or the other, right? How do you, what do you do about it? How do you combat conformity? You combat conformity through transformation. How do you tra how are you transformed? You're transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. As you renew your mind in God's word, you start establishing new pathways to the barn. Okay? Read the rest of verse 2. By the renewing of your mind, that is the purpose and the intent that ye may what? Prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? The purpose and the intent of this process is that God's will is proved in our lives. God's will is proved in our lives. The meaning here of the English word prove is very important here. Okay, So according to the Oxford English Dictionary, prove means to put a person or thing to the test. To test the genuineness or qualities of. To test by tasting to sample. Okay? Now, hold your hand there and come over to 1 Thessalonians 5. As a illustration of that word being used that way, the dictionary gives you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. 
Okay? It gives you this verse as an example of that word prove. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll start at verse 18. In everything, do what? Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying. Prophesying. Look at verse 21. Prove what? All things. Hold fast to that which is what? Good. That's the same word that's translated prove in Romans 12 too. Come with me back to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. You remember the story of David and Goliath? Come back to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. You remember the story of David and Goliath? Goliath's harassing Israel, right? And no one, no one is really uh, willing to stand up and so forth. And so David, I'm sort of cutting to the chase here. David says what? I'll do it. Right? What does Saul want to do? He wants to give him his armor. Right? So Saul, all David has is the slingshot, and Saul's like, okay, David, sounds good. We'll let you do it. Right? Here, take my armor. All right? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head, also, he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not what? Proved it. David says what? Thanks, but what? No thanks. I don't, I've not proved this. I've not used this. I've not tested this. This is unknown territory for me. I'm not going to go out. If God can deliver me from the hand of the bear, the lion and the bear and so forth, then he's certainly capable of delivering me from him. And I'm not going to go out there, Saul, with your stuff that I've not what? Not proved. Verse 39, And David girded, girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not what? Prove them, and David put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand, and chose five smooth stones of the brook, and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to what? See, David is, David is going to go out to battle here with things that he's what? Proved. That he's familiar with, that he's tested, that he knows. Right? Go back to, go back to Romans 12. Go back to Romans 12. <clears throat> Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may what? Prove. What, do you, what, are, we, what are we proving here? What are, we, what are we putting to the test here? See, when you renew your mind, you're proving. You're putting to the test God's what? Will. His good, acceptable, and what? I used to read that verse and I used to think, that, oh, I renew my mind. So now I can go out and I can find the good and acceptable and perfect will. I don't think that's what that's saying. I think that's saying that when you renew your mind, that by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, you're putting to the test that what God says in His Word is good, is acceptable, and is what? True and perfect. Will it work? Will it do for you? Will it do for, uh, for me what it's supposed to do? Yes. Okay? So let me finish my notes. When we renew our minds and are transformed, we prove or put to the test or test 
the genuine or qualities of God's will in our lives. When we do so, we find God's will to be good, acceptable, and perfect. Okay? These are not degrees of the will of God that we go out and prove in the sense of establishing them as true. Okay? These are, these are what are demonstrated to us about God's Word and His will when we renew our what? Mind. Rather, through the transformation process, rather through the transformation process that is brought about by the renewing of our mind, the good and acceptable, per, the good, acceptable and perfect nature of God's will will confirm itself to us in our experience. We don't need... To, and you, you need to please hear me on this. We don't need to kill the good in our lives by seeking to chase down the perfect. How many Christians, how many believers are worried about finding and laying hold on the perfect that they don't appreciate the good? That verse is not about you finding the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. That verse is you understanding that God's will is all of those things. We don't need to kill the good in our lives by seeking to chase down the perfect. Good, acceptable, and perfect are adjectives that describe the will of God that is proved within us when we renew our minds and are transformed. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. We'll end here. 2 Corinthians 10. We'll end with verse 5. Well, we'll end with verse 3 through 5. He says, For though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after what? The flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God are the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of who? So what we're talking about here this weekend is Pauline neurotheology. Building godly character one thought at what? A time casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of what? Christ. And when you by faith act on that, you start establishing a new route to the barn. I hope that makes sense to you. Let's pray and then I have a, a few just housekeeping announcements. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time and for the, the weekend that we have together to share in your word. These things go fast. Before you know it, it'll be Sunday and it'll be over. I pray that we'll be able to enjoy our time together in the Word, be able to um, just really think about what's being said and meditate upon it and, and just allow it to, to, to really be something that we, we really give a lot of mental energy and attention to. And we're just grateful for all those that are here. We've got people from Minnesota, other states, from long distances that have come to be a part of what we're doing here this weekend. We just, we just really appreciate that and are excited about that. We have other people joining us um, on the internet and the live stream and so forth. We're just grateful for the time we can spend together in your word. I appreciate uh, Brother Craig and Brother Des being willing to um, labor in the, in the word and doctrine this weekend and, and uh, just, just be a part of what we're trying to accomplish here with getting this information across. We just pray that this would be a time of edification for all the saints. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.